Join us, friends. Great Scott Spock guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, Spock Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the Spock guy, and it is... Loach riding with Trey. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey. But I'll tell you what. There's a lot of people that are wishing Cotton was a monkey out there in the world, even some detectives. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about this uh, Netflix. It's a Netflix documentary, I believe, called American Nightmare. It's three episodes. Uh, the first time I heard about this, I heard about it from my daughter, um, which was on a podcast last year with uh, some true crime stuff for us. Mm -hmm. And the second time I heard about it, I listened to the Rick and Bubba show out of Birmingham, Alabama, and they were talking about it. And they were discussing how um, each episode made you think, oh, well, this person probably did it. Then you watch the next episode and go, no, nah, it was probably this. And so it's this whole this whole crazy thing. Um, and we're going to get into the meat of the thing. It's just three episodes, but it's very, very interesting. And... Trey and I have actually experienced something very similar. Uh, not We haven't been kidnapped or anything of that nature, but some of the ways this thing went down, we've experienced something similar. In fact, Trey even uh, wrote me or texted me and said, hey, man, you need to watch this because there's some stuff in here that's relatable that will give you hope. And uh, so I watched it, uh, Laurie and I watched it together, and um, quite interesting. But before we go into that, I want to touch on something that I left out. Me and you did a couple of episodes about jobs that we did in the past, and we left something out about you that we needed to touch on, and that was that you actually taught school. You were a substitute teacher at we're in high school, right? Yeah, I did do that for a little bit. Okay, so tell us about that. I was just, you know, when I was graduating from college, um, they, they need some substitutes at the high school where I uh, graduated from. And yeah, they started putting me to work because, man, I was getting calls every day. You'd get like it was a program where it would call you and it was like, hey, so-and-so so needs a teacher. Do you accept this job or not? You know, it was like a computer. Would it call you at six o'clock in the morning? Oh, yeah. Five yeah. in the morning, yeah. drive me crazy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but yeah, it, I'd started doing some substitute teaching uh, while I was in college. Um, you know, finishing up college, it was interesting. So, you know, it just it showed me I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> so could y'all imagine Trey is your high school teacher? <laughs> oh, hey, I was a popular high school teacher, and your hair was real long back then, right? Yeah, no, I was. A little shorter than this. So it was. It was actually shorter. Yeah, than you know, I I only grew my hair out the last two or three years because of you know some of the acting things that I've done. Look, it was longer than that because I've known you over five years, and you had long hair when I met you. I did. Yeah. So you didn't know me how my hair real used to be. No, no, I've seen photos of it short, but I've never uh, seen you without long hair. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy because like yeah, I just. Uh, cause I, I got, you know, I had it real long at one point because I was on that frontier show. Yeah. You know, my hair made me a lot of money. So yeah. you know, if you, people, people want to hate on your hair. I can tell you girls like the hair. Yeah. I can also tell you a lot of you want some hair. Yeah. I do. You know, love, look at this. I would love to have some, but the funny part about that, the, the hair thing is my hair has made me thousands of dollars. Yeah. When it's kind of crazy to think about that because it's character, you know. I mean, I just played a surfer in a commercial that's running right now all over in Latin America and on social media here. So, you know, I mean, I'm getting paid. I, I actually got my paycheck the other day, and just, just let's just say it put a smile on my face. Nice, nice, um, uh, nice large number there written on that check, and it's the first one of a few more. So, anyway, anyway, but the it's crazy to think that it, it, because of acting is, you know, it's a character is, you know, do you look like a frontiersman? Do you look like a surfer? You know, that's how you book these roles. You gotta, so I'm always thinking about the acting thing, you know, 
Plus, you have to update headshots. So if you if you cut your hair a whole different style, then you've got to go update all these headshots and change your whole portfolio. You know. Yeah, you got to stay on top of it to get work. That's for sure. I also kind of scared to cut my hair real off because sometimes it don't grow back. Hey, hey, I'm I can attest to that. I used to have a lot of hair. <laughs> uh, so you know. <laughs> And my hair is thicker than it was at one time, but um, it's going back the other way, luckily. But yeah, I had some lady told me uh, a girl that cut my hair one time and said that by the um, the volume that they can tell that I don't have to worry about going bald on the top. Yeah, I don't know, Trey. When I was your age, um, I want you to know when I was your age, I had a lot of hair. Okay. I did not have a, a bald spot at all when I was your age. So, well, let's, you know, hopefully it doesn't. But hey, <laughs> well, yeah. hope, if it's not in your family, my dad uh, was bald and um, early. He was bald a lot earlier than I was. So, I will hopefully never be bald. If I, if it starts going that way, I'll probably buy some hair, not a toupee. I'll get implants or something. But anyway, will you uh, post it online? Like, will you show us the process of how stupid? Uh, probably not. Okay, no, yeah, don't do that. No, because, no, because I, it's not, I'm, I'm not, well, anyway. Uh, so let's go into, so let's, episode one was very interesting. And some things stuck out to me in that episode. Um, and one thing was, so, so let's set the scenario up and I'll tell a little bit of it. And then I want you to tell what you remember about it. But the scenario is basically this. Um, they get a 911 call in this town, the local police department. And this guy is so calm. He's not going, oh, my God, my girlfriend was taken and I was tied up. He's going, this is, um, uh, what? hold on, let me let me find his name real quick, Trey. Is it, is it Aaron? Aaron, yeah. yeah. Aaron Quinn and Denise Huskins. That's so cool. he goes, this is Aaron Quinn. And I'm just calling to tell you that my girlfriend was taken. Well, when was she taken? Oh, like three o'clock in the morning. And it was like 10 o'clock in the morning or something. And I may have that off a little bit, but it's close. Well, why haven't you called before now? Right. And he said it nonchalantly, like, well, I was tied up. And that, the way he said it meant, well, I was just too, too busy to come call. But no, he meant he was physically tied up and he was. And so what he claims happened is he's awakened in the middle of the night. They don't hear anybody come in the house. There's no break in. There's no sign of force entry. All that it is, is a, he mentioned a strobe light and a, uh, a red laser, like a red dot laser, like you would have on a gun. And both of them mentioned the laser and the light. And I think he even said strobe. Like it was blinding him. They, I remember them mentioning the word strobe. And some of those flashlights, you know, they can do a strobe mode or they can do a flashlight mode or they can do a bright or a dim. But I think this was in strobe mode with the red, with the red dot on as mm -hmm. well. So a laser, two different items. So what ended up happening is um, he said that the guy even called him by name. You remember that? Yeah. He, said, he said, Aaron, I want you to lie face down on the bed. And then when he realized that the girl was not Aaron's old girlfriend, he took her anyway. He said, I'm re I'm actually not here for her. And But he made her get on top of him and tie his hands behind his back with a pull tie. And so her not resisting and g jumping on his back and pulling his, his arms behind his back with the pull tie for this guy that just happened to walk into this room made me go, hmm. Why? Yeah, why wouldn't she resist? Because I could tell you, if somebody comes in my room at 3 o'clock in the morning and shines a light at me, they're going to get a fight. I'm not going to just roll over on the bed and let them tie me down. And this guy just rolled over. She climbed on his back, according to him, pull tied it. They put swim goggles over his eyes that had tape on them, is the way he described it. And he even described that the guy let him lay there for a while and, and fill in any blanks if you remember anything. So the way I envisioned it in the beginning was he took the girl, left him laying on the bed. No, he took him down to the living room and had him sitting 
in a square. He had taped off a square and said, yeah. do not leave this square. I've got a camera on you. And if you leave this square or if I see you call the cops, I'm going to kill her. Right? Right. That was okay. True. Okay. So when he, but then he heard his car crank and he heard it drive out of the, out of the um, uh, driveway, which was a Toyota Camry. So, and basically the first episode is him telling this story, all of the details of it, him going to the cops, the cops questioning him, all those kinds of things. So he said that he stood there or sat there for, I think about maybe two hours. And then he decided to call 911. Well, am I about right? I felt like he fell asleep and he wakes up. He yeah, wakes but up. Okay, that, so I left that detail out. So you're right. So he gave him a cocktail. That was the other thing was he was very specific. What did he say the cocktail was? It was NyQuil. NyQuil. Yeah. And something else. Yeah. And that's and, and that's why he was drowsy talking. That's right. And, and that's why he was saying he was so drowsy when he was talking to him. Yeah. But, but it almost sound made up. You know, he's because he's saying a very specific formula. And I don't remember what he said, but there was two things. Seemed like it was NyQuil and something else. But the guy must have told him, hey, I'm giving you something. It's just NyQuil and this. It's just going to make you go to sleep. You need to drink it. Right. So you know what he did? He drank it. He drank it. <laughs> you know what I'd have done? Gone friggin' nuts. <laughs> you know, and, but he drank it. And uh, and this guy now, so let's let's get this out of the out of the um out of the way. In the when they're talking to him in the video, he seems very meek and mild to me. Did did you perceive that same thing? I, I, I he he just you know was very like laid back and just yeah. Right. But like, he was uh, the captain of the football team. He was what? He was the captain of the football team. He was a quarterback. Right, yeah. yeah. A meek and mild guy is not the captain of the football team, not the quarterback. Yeah. Right? Right. You so would think. It, didn't, it didn't fit. Later we find out that he was the captain of the football team, very popular in school, all this kind of stuff. And he had a good job. He was a, a physical therapist. And they were calling them both doctors. They both were physical therapists. And they were calling them both doctors, which that's not doctor in the sense of a doctor. That's a physical therapy, maybe with a doctorate in physical therapy. But they were using the word doctor. And that's not in the in the true sense of a medical doctor. They were physical therapists, basically, him and her. And the third girl, his ex-girlfriend. They that also, had, to begin. They also worked with them. They all worked at the same place. That's right. The same yeah. hospital. Yeah. So the whole time that I'm watching this, I'm going, I see the ex-girlfriend knowing that he's dating this girl, sending somebody in there to take her away and just dispose of her. That's what I started thinking. Right. And that's or, what they intended for you to. Or it, him being in, is that what you thought too? Well, that's how they were painting it. Because yeah. they, they, they started telling us this story and how he was not over the ex. Yeah. And she, uh, the other girlfriend, current girlfriend, uh, uh, Denise, found out about that. That's right. They were texting and doing stuff, and Denise had just found out about it. He still was, you know, I guess, had those feelings for the, other, for the uh, ex. And, uh, and then we learned that the ex and the niece work together. Yeah. They don't talk, but they, you know. They have to be polite to each All other. All three of them work together. Yeah. All same place. Yeah. So yeah. So that yeah, that makes the story a lot more like okay. So what's happened here? Yeah, because I, then I start thinking about her going, hmm. So she could have found her brother or some man to go in there and take this ex girl, this new girlfriend, and get rid of her. Yeah. You know, and that would also account for. They never accounted in the whole thing. They never accounted for how he got into the house without anybody hearing him. Exactly. They never accounted either for him saying, hey, I came here for the other girl. Do you remember her name? I don't remember. I see her, but I don't remember. I could see her. Uh, but he. they never account for her. Um, and, and what I'm saying is they never really tell you uh, – much about her other than at the end of this episode, I think they bring her in and sit her down 
like she's going to talk, but you never, ever hear her talk. So you're right. They, they made the first episode, made you think it was her yeah. with the first episode. But what it made me think was she would have had a key probably to the apartment and or to the house. And so she would have given the key to someone or whoever did it got the key from her. So they never really said how this guy got in this house without breaking and entering. How did he just slip in the house? Well, I think because later on, what you're going to find out that this guy has some experience. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he, he can, he can do that. He can get into houses yeah. because. <laughs> yeah. But I wonder, he came specifically for the other girlfriend. Mm -hmm. He said that verbally to them. Oh, Lord, I came for such a such. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know. So he didn't know. He must have been planning it for a long time. Yeah. I didn't know that she was gone. So, but I'm still going to take her, is what he said. You know, and uh, and he even drew up, didn't they say, he drew up this thing. And I told my wife, I said, is there um, a such thing as kidnapping ink? You know, he said, we all, we run a company that's uh, a black ops company and, you know, we we specialize in kidnapping and it's a group of us. He painted this whole picture of basically a company that kidnaps people. <laughs> you know, we were hired to kidnap. Did, is that not what he said? Man. You know, he painted this whole thing. And I told Lori, I said, is there a kidnap ink? Is that a, is that a thing? I don't think so, because you don't hear of that many kidnappings. Right. So I don't see how that's a thing, but so that made me suspicious. And the whole time I'm trying to figure this out, you know, I'm, I'm going, okay, so how, how did this, what, what went on? It's kind of like, have you ever played um, my daughter when she was um, early teen, she loved the Nancy Drew games, computer games. You could buy a Nancy Drew game. And she would work at it until she solved that mystery. But now once you solve the mystery, that CD-ROM's no good. Okay. Or to the next one. It's one mystery. You have to buy a new one. And we recently, for Christmas, I think we did it. It may have been Thanksgiving. She bought one. It wasn't a computer ROM game. It was a, it was a game that came in a box. And in the box, there was, you got four people could play it. And basically, they start unveiling clues until you figure out who did that crime. And so it was all of us together as detectives listening and reading all of the stuff. And we were able to figure out who actually did the crime by reading the things and comparing this note to that note and inconsistencies. And we were able to figure it out. So whenever we're doing Elvis stuff, that's what I'm doing. I'm listening and comparing it to things I know to be factual and seeing what's true and what's not true. In the Nancy Drew game, I was doing that. In this, uh, in this murder mystery, basically American Nightmare, I'm doing the exact same thing, and I know you were too. Yeah, you're listening. You're you're, you're remembering little details, like you just talked about. Like what what was the mess? Uh, what did he take to knock him out? Yeah, that's, that's gonna yeah, come. He back. called him by name. That stuck out to me. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He called him by name. What else also stuck out to me? It was, it was like the guy was was kind of nice. Yeah, he was very nice and you very nice with him. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, this kidnapper was kind of like you know just kind of. It wasn't like he was that you you're scared to death over him. Yeah, but you he didn't destroy the house, and he really didn't threaten them that much. Exactly. That's exactly. what I'm saying. It's kind of bizarre to me. So this guy shows up in his bedroom with uh with this what he's claiming is a gun with a, a strobe light. He blinds him and blinds him, which disorients him. And, and then he makes up. him turn over, let him tie him up. Then he makes him drink something, and he does all of it. Yeah, that he just kind of conforms and and yes, sir, yeah, yeah, you know, and did much. it all. And so and we're uh, talking about the captain of the football team. Yeah. Just said okay, and it but it shows kind of like you know um I we all probably would react differently, differently to that type of situation um, because that's just not something you just experience. I mean, that's, it's not right. You know, that's not, that's, that's something terrible, <laughs> you know, like, so you don't know how you 
probably are going to react to it if that ever happened to you. But he did. He followed the rules because there was a camera that was up in the corner. And remember when he goes to the uh, he's with the detective and they're questioning him. You know, he points at the camera. It was like it was just like that camera right there in the corner. Mm -hmm. It was looking, you know, was looking at me and I couldn't leave that those that tape because I was told to. He had my girl. He had my girl. And also he was requesting uh, uh, money. Yes. Fifteen thousand dollars on his phone. OK. And so let's so get he, into that. Yeah. So he could only uh, uh, get thirty five hundred dollars out of his account. And so he emails the guy back and he said about 20 minutes goes by, nothing. You know, he hadn't responded. And then he finally responds. And I guess it was something like, no, that's not going to work. Yeah, yeah, right. Is that right? And I think that's when he decided to call the cops, right? That's when he decides to call the cops. That's right. Already, I think six and a half hours had gone by. That's six right. Hours. It'd been a while. He woke up and he saw the clock, right? I think he woke up. He might have not woke up. It might have been a girl later on. I might be getting that wrong. But he did wait six hours before calling the cops because he was following this person's. What uh, they told him, that he would go kill her. He, he was obeying what they gave him, you know, because he right. was thinking about uh, uh, them harming his girlfriend. And up to then, he had obeyed all the other stuff. So now he's in the living room in this box with like duct tape on the floor. Right, right. And the camera. So now he's called the cops. They take him to the to the station. They're questioning him. And he does what you said. He says there was a camera just like that in the corner. So to me, if I was a detective and I heard that, I'd have gone, well, we need to get somebody over there right now to trace the feed of that camera, where that feed is going. But they didn't do that. What did they do? Well, they tried to make him confess a, a murder. That's exactly right. They decided that he did it, and that he got he he had disposed of her body. And they start and saying, they, "I mean, the, the the detective, that guy that was detective of the year in 2015." Yeah, uh, what was his name? Mott. Yeah, we need to Mott Mustard. M A T Mustard. You go remember that. Lori, that's Colonel Mustard's brother. <laughs> <laughs> Watch this, yeah. So that detective. That detective just went all in with like, and you can tell by the the the, the way that he phrased his questions to this to this guy, and 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 the guy was smart. The the uh, the young the man um, uh, Aaron, he he picked up on at, yeah. at, at a certain point. He he was because I remember him was like I, I guess I need I, I guess I need a, a lawyer. I guess yeah. I need, uh, uh, and that's smart because you don't want to talk. You don't yeah. want to talk. Well, on and top of that, they did tell them about the lie detector test. Oh, man. I was, uh, Billy, that made me mad. It made me mad, too. Because uh, uh, I think you see the lie detector test in the second episode. You see it then, in the first episode, then you see it in the third. In, in the third. And then yeah. in the third, because we, we really learned the results in the third because he, he reads it. And then you go back to what the guy that administered the lie detector test to him told him. That guy, and they do it a certain way. You know, he got right up in his face, you know. Now, look, I can tell you about 100 percent fact that you failed this test. So we know that you did something with your girl. Yeah. Yeah. He it's said those were his, yeah. this was just detectives. Work. What it is. Make it easy on yourself. Go ahead and tell us. Make it easy because they yeah. want to make it easy on their self. Yeah. And get, they didn't want to work. Yep. They didn't want to investigate, but I think that was their job, right? Uh, is a de- what is we a de- found out that the cops won't do their job a lot of them. What's a detective's job? To, to figure it out. Now, I will say, in their defense, just for a moment, and this is a tiny moment because the, this whole police department was a mess, but just for a tiny moment, <laughs> in their defense, I'm going to say that the story sounds so crazy that it sounds made up. I will but agree that, with that. But, but that's why that's why it is so important, I think, for you, me, everyone out there watching that watches this documentary to see if you just automatically, without any proof, knowing that this person did this crime, and you know it without knowing. You got to have some proof. You can't just assume 
uh, uh, by what you've been told or you think. You need it to. Yes, to- before proven guilty. They decided he was guilty. Guilty before. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. And man, and man, that is scary. That is scary. Like when I, how, I, how the questions that he were, he was as, asking Aaron, I'm thinking to myself, oh man, they're trying to pin this on him right yeah. from the get, get go. Cause they were like, Oh man, they ain't no other. Uh, um, there's no other answer for any of this. He he had to do it, and, and we they, don't know at that moment. We don't know the rest of the story. So we're thinking. I'm thinking, maybe he's in on it with her, and they know something that they're well, not saying. But I wasn't thinking that because he's being interviewed on this Netflix doc. Yeah, well, I was that's like, true. we actually see him on there. He's not in jail. He's not in jail. He, that's true. Uh, so something's going on here. Okay, so let's go to episode two. All right. All right. So in episode two, we, we don't hear from him anymore. Now we're hearing from the young lady. What was her name? Denise. Denise Huskins. 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 So Denise Huskins, they do a background on her. She's, uh, they talk to her parents and her parents go, she was a wonderful child, never gave us a problem. In fact, the boy, Aaron's parents said, wonderful child, never gave us a problem. Always been good as gold, did good in school. She went for, uh, her dream was to be a physical therapist. She went to school. She got a degree. She started doing her job, living her life out. Just was a model citizen, a model child, never in trouble, either one of them. So then you see, uh, they had videos of her with him on the beach and them, him holding her up and then spinning around and recordings of that. And it seems like she was at maybe a birthday party. And then her as a little girl. And then you see her, you see a video where she's been released. So let's talk about that for a minute. So when I see that video, a couple of things hit my mind. And one of them is, is her father. I think her father and her mother are divorced. Am I thinking right about that? Right. Okay. And the father lives about four hours south of where they lived in Vallejo. It's Vallejo, California is where this happened at. He lives about four hours south in this town, which is where she grew up. So after 48 hours, a little after 48 hours, she shows up at his house four hours later in a town where she grew up. So when I saw that, I went, hmm, hmm, did she fake this thing, have her boyfriend tied up, go down there and hang out and blow it out for a couple of days with an old high school boyfriend or whatever. And the other thing is when you see the video of her, there's a guy walking behind her. Did you know that? I noticed that man. on the phone. And I was like, now I asked Lori, now that's weird. What is that dude doing? And she's wearing scrubs and she's carrying a, uh, like a, a, a pack. Like she had she, a bag on her. Like, I noticed yeah. she had, I noticed she had a, like a bag on her. Yeah, it was like uh, my wife would take if we were going to spend the night somewhere. Exactly. Uh, one of those, uh, like a not a duffel bag, but a bag with a handle on it. She had it around her. Yeah. And I looked at that and I thought, it just looks like she just went somewhere and, and st- stayed a couple of days and now she's showing up. So then they start showing you the footage of where she calls the police there, those police call Vallejo and they start battering back and forth and going, well, we need to talk to her. And then the next thing you know, all of the uh, media shows up down there. She comes out wearing sunglasses with a hoodie and gets in a car and drives off. So it makes her look guilty, right? You're right. And uh, so you're looking at that going, what happened here? And um, so... They, the way all that was done is it made her look real guilty. Then, the not the police chief, but a spokesman for the Vallejo police come out comes out, which he had already spoken a couple of different times, updating and talking about the manhunt and all those kinds of things. He comes out and says, um, there's been some updates. We found her. And they even started comparing it to the movie Gone Girl, where the girl tried to set her husband up and make it look like he had murdered her. 
And so they actually start calling her, the media starts calling her Gone Girl. Mm. And because this guy says something, and when he said it, it made me go, hmm. And this is kind of familiar to me and you. And that is, he said, so he said that we found her, everybody's safe, everybody's good. But, and then he should have shut up, but he didn't. He made one more statement. And that statement was, well, it looks like that Aaron and Denise are going to owe the, the town of Vallejo money for causing all of this ruckus and all of the time spent for the police and uh, char charges. Basically, he accused them of faking all this he did. on national TV. Hmm. So what do you think happened then? Well, after that statement by this fella. Like you said, he should have shut up. Don't don't say things you don't know is fact. That's right. Um, and he did it on on there. Of course, they started receiving hate messages from people they didn't even know that had no idea who they were and never met before. Didn't know the story. Didn't don't, know the truth. Don't know their characters. Don't know who they are. Don't know anything about them. And they're receiving these these hate messages on Facebook social media that really uh I, I know that I felt sorry for um for Denise because you know she you could really tell how it, this affected her like mentally. Yeah they were I think they were getting death threats weren't they? They were getting death threats they were showing messages on screen that you know I mean everybody saves everybody has and you me know? and you can kind of um relate to that a little bit. Oh yeah people definitely. that people that don't know us don't know the truth don't know the real story. Mm -hmm. and have believed lies that somebody said about them. But instead of them trying to figure out if it's true or not, they just repeat them. Yeah, and what sense. is that called, Trey? Do what now? What is that called when somebody uh, does uh, that? Uh, is that like defamation or? Defamation, slander, slander. character assassination. Character and there's assassination. laws against that. There is laws against that. And I, I can't believe that a, that a, um, you, it was a representative of, of that police station, police department. I can't believe that this fellow, without knowing that that is legit, uh, what he, he said, I can't believe he went out there and buried that couple like that. They soon regretted that. Oh, they soon. So, and so just, and that's the thing that, that, that gives us hope is that, when things like that happen, there is justice for that. Let's just say that. So now let's go to uh, the end of episode two, and then we need to flip to three because we're running short of time. So at the end of episode two, they bring Denise out, and she talks, and she tells what happened, and her story lines up with his story, and they had never been allowed to talk. So both of them have hired attorneys because she realized the same thing. Hey, they think I did this. And so she hires an attorney. So imagine this, you're both victims and the police have treated you so badly that you had to get go out and hire attorneys, both of you. Mm -hmm. You were not allowed to talk. Yeah. So imagine that, like you said, Spy Guy, you're victims. You've been tied up. You've been taken from your home. You've been stuffed in a back of a Mustang, uh, um, the back of a Mustang mm -hmm. trunk. And then we'll get to all the craziness. And Been held captive. So let's get to this. She did say that she was raped twice by this guy. Mm -hmm. And the guy told her that he had to rape her and film it in case she ever went to the police. Oh. Then he would release that to the internet to keep her from going to the police. So which, imagine, of course, she went straight to the police. So imagine that. He set up a tripod. He set up a tripod and filmed her and she had goggles on with that tape. So she never sees this fella. All right. He has his way with this girl filming it and then comes back like the next day or two and yeah, said the, that that the footage didn't work, that she was going to have to have sex with him again. And make it look like she was his girlfriend. And, and that's what he said. I know it is, man. Yeah, you, make it look like it's consensual. Right, so he raped her again. Second come on, time. man. Yeah, come on now. And uh, yeah, make it look like that. You know, you care about me or whatever, right? And uh, and so she did it. 
Okay, so I generally think that the police are on my side, especially as a victim. What do you feel? I'm not talking about aftermath. I'm talking about just in general. Two years ago, I said they were on my side. Yeah. Um, You know, recently from experiences, now I would question. um, And I'm exactly the same. So that's my point is, She felt like, and he felt like going to the police was the right thing to do, but she did not originally tell him that she was raped because the guy had told her, if you tell them, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to kill your family. I know where y'all are from. Right. And, and I may have the detail with the, the father and the mother being, um, being divorced. I may have that wrong. It may be that they're filming the mother, but I never really saw the father and the mother Together. I think you're right. Uh, it was the mother and the son, and then the father flew up there. I do. That's what I perceive. Yeah. So anyway, um, that's an aside. I just wanted to clear that up for anybody who's yelling at the computer or the the phone right now. Um. So the thing with with them is, is she went to them. Her attorney's going, look, we need to get a rape kit, and they go, not before we question her and determine before we do that. So the reality was they should have immediately gotten a rape kit, but they made her go through all this questioning and all this other stuff. And still was not going to do the rape kit, even after she told them exactly what happened and it all lined up. She even said, I was put in the back of a Mustang is what it sounded like. It was white in color. He took me here, here. She even got the street and said, I, it, I turned here. We went here. We turned here because she was listening for how far it was before the next turn, trying to figure out where she was at. So she was very smart about the whole thing. But when you start looking at that, it almost makes you go, so is he in on it? She was really. So the second one, you start going, I I don't know. But the reality of, of it is, is the police had no right ever to decide that somebody did something until they know and can prove it. This guy walked out on national TV and accused these two. He didn't accuse them. He said they did it. You know, accusing is, hey, we think they did it. No, he said, these two people are going to have to pay us back for all the resources that they use. By doing that, people believed because the guy was a cop, he, they believed that guy guy, and, and, and it caused all this hate to these people. I mean, people could harm them. People could, you know, so now they look at these two, this couple that they faked all this. No doubt about it. The cops Mm -hmm. said it. So you Mm -hmm. did it. You Mm -hmm. you did it. Y'all are horrible people. You know, horrible. Y'all are horrible people. You know, man. And and man, but man, who gets the last laugh at the end, you know? so, So now let's go to episode three. So in episode three, all of a sudden, you they introduced this this detective, a lady. So how did they end up at the guy's house? How did they end up at the guy's house? Okay, so so don't you remember there was a um, so a, a guy breaks into a uh, another home. That's right. And tried to take the guy's daughter. Take the daughter of this and guy. The, and the, the guy dad, went nuts on him. That's the right. The dad fought the guy. That's right. Right. And they left his, he left his phone. That's what I was getting at. Okay. That's what I was getting at. So the guy is fighting him. The mom calls. You can hear a commotion in the background. The, the, the kidnapper intruder gets away, right? Yeah. It's away. So the police go out there and, but, and, you know, at luckily they show us the house, they show us the, the guy where he walked at the cop that came on the scene and stuff like that. And, um, so anyway, the guy gets away, but wait, yeah, they get a phone call later on from the girl and said, "Hey, he left his phone on the counter." Yep. This moron, this dummy. I mean, you got to be a dumb, just you stupid. You're just stupid to do this in the first place. You even take your phone, especially if you're going to do something like that. But you yeah. moron, you left your phone there. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, man. That, he that's didn't take the girl. By the way, the father stopped that. He went nuts on him, like Thank I was God. talking about. Yeah. And so anyway. So we got a phone now. We have a phone. All right. And uh, what do you think the cops do with that phone? 
they're able to immediately get his information, his emails, all of his stuff. So they go to his house. And guess what's sitting in the driveway? Well, but let's get back, though. Okay. They call. They take his phone. And they call the number, the first number on there. And it was his mama. That's right. That's and, right. And they didn't tell his mom. They just said, hey, you know, we found this phone. We wanted to know who it belonged to. And she was like, oh, that's my son. And well, where's your son at? Oh, he's at our um, our winter home or, you know, like our mountain home. Mm-hmm. So, uh, ma'am, where's that located at? You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> blah, yeah, blah, blah. House. It's it's in a neighborhood with a uh, on the coast. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So or that the- is. Yeah. So they, uh, so that's how they go to this home and the cops go in there and they're searching around and then they find him in the house. That's right. And, and there's then, a white Mustang sitting a in white, the driveway that's stolen. There's a white Mustang that's stolen in the driveway. White Mustang. Denise, really, that's really right. good. Denise, really good. Uh, also, the guy had everything right there in his living room that incriminated himself. He had the tape, the, the duct tie. tape. He they found the goggles. And hey. this detective now, so this detective's a hero. What was her name, Trey? Yeah, we need to call we her. Find her name because she is the hero in she, this whole thing. She gives me hope that there's that there's that one light out there that wants to know the truth. And that right. that, that that there's one little thing that she had to figure out and prove. That's Who, right. You know, I'm not going to say it yet, but she set out and she did the work and she didn't take no for an answer. Right, Billy? Yeah. So so what happened is so I'm looking it up. Detective um, American Nightmare. So we know Matt Mustard's not worth a Ghibli Duke. She's an angel. Uh, and this lady, this lady is absolutely over the top. And by the way, the FBI agent, we left this out. The FBI agent that was investigating this was friends with this dude's ex-girlfriend. I was going to get to that. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Trey. The Are FBI agent. Go do now what? Now listen at this. Now listen, listen at this, guys. The FBI agent was dated the ex. All right? That's right. So. Then it makes me think maybe he's involved. But he's the <laughs> one that towed that representative for the police department to burn them. No, that was the police chief. That was the police chief. I'm that getting that the wrong. Police chief of Vallejo. But they, those two guys look alike. That's right. Okay. So, that was the, so was, we'll, we'll get to that at the end. Okay. Well, because they brought him in and questioned him. That was the chief of police at Vallejo. All right. So set that right. So it was a st- uh, chief of police. Yes. So okay. let's get back to this lady's name. The detective is Misty. Carasso, C A R A U S U S U, Caruso, and she's a detective in Dublin, California. Okay, so what happens is this crime, he where he is at is in Dublin. She goes to the house, she investigates it. She find they find the Mustang. She starts looking at all the stuff. These goggles, these swim goggles with tape on them, they have one blonde hair, and she goes, okay. She starts looking for around him victims that fit that crime. And they start finding a lot of victims that fit. This guy comes in in the middle of the night. He shines a light and a laser in your eyes. He makes you drink something, a sedative that knocks you out. He, the, all these things start lining up with all these crimes. and she's But she keeps looking at the girls and going, well, she's got dark hair. Nope, she's got dark hair. There's a blonde victim out there somewhere. Where is she at? So how do they find that there's a, a series of actions that happen that lead them to finding this lady because somehow she hadn't heard of um of the gone girl. Uh, yeah, somehow situation. somebody asked her, had you looked into the gone girl case? I know who it was. It was the person that owned the Mustang. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the people, the Mustang was stolen. And by the way, on the um, GPS on the Mustang, was the town that she was dropped off in where her parents lived, her father lived. The, the, so he had used that Mustang to take her there, a stolen car. So she calls the uh, the owner of the Mustang convertible 
and says, hey, um, we've got your car and we just want you to know that we've got this and this and this and this and this. And she starts talking about it. And he go, and the girl, the guy goes, hey, you know about the Gone Girl uh, situation? She goes, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, over in such and such, the Gone Girl thing. And so she looks it up and then sees Denise Huskin's face and goes, she's blonde. And reads the stuff and starts going, this matches exactly with my stuff. Puts two and two together. Hey, she's she should win that detective of the year, not that two thousand that guy that Matt mustard, Mott mustard. It's M A T mustard, Mott mustard. Pin pin him from the get go. But anyway, yeah. yeah so yeah. so she picks up a phone and calls that police department and can't get an answer. Yeah, they won't even answer the phone. No answer. Calls. No answer. Calls. No answer. Calls. Finally, someone answers the phone. And they're like, well, you need to talk to the FBI. They're like, they didn't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He called this ex girlfriend's, the guy that she was dating, that guy. And um, and his name was, um, he's an FBI agent. His name was, uh, just keep on talking while I'm looking. So she does contact the FBI. And the FBI sets David up a, Sesma is his name. The FBI sets up a, a, a meeting with them. And then that's where they present everything. And the best part is they see the gun with a laser. That's right. So so let's get into this. All right. So this, this is, and look, we're running over. In fact, I'm gonna do this just, just to be doing it. We're way Play over. Your, but we're gonna see this till we get to the end. So let's go back and talk about something. So they are crucifying Aaron and Denise in the in the media. This dude, the aggressor, um, what is his name? Yeah, what is his name? Muller. Matthew Muller. So the guy that actually raped her and took her, Matthew Muller, that they've been that they've raided his house. When he found out that they were accusing her of the crime, actually sent emails to the police department and to the local crime uh, uh, reporter going, hey, no, I we really did take her. Here's pictures of where she was kept. Here's pictures of the gun. He's so, trying to keep her. He yeah. feels sorry for her. He's yeah. trying to, to, and that's the thing that was odd about him was he felt for his victim, even though he did rape her. He felt for her enough to go, hey, no. He, he knew what he was doing. Happen. He knew what he was doing was wrong. That's right. And you could just tell by like the things that he would say to him and stuff like that. But he could he couldn't stop doing what he did. Did and he was a he wasn't he a marine? He was a lawyer. Oh, Harvard. He's a Harvard. He's a Harvard trained lawyer. He was smart, you know. But he those. was ex military too and had P PTSD. That's right. Um, and uh, but yeah, he was a Harvard trained lawyer. But anyway, so he feels so sorry for her. he's sending emails and he sends a picture of the gun, a picture of where she was held captive, a picture of all this stuff. So when they look at the gun that they took from this guy's house, same gun, it's just the photograph, the same tape on it, everything. Right. <laughs> and it has the flashlight and the laser on it, just like Aaron said, just like Denise said. I just wonder what that detective must mustard thought when he saw these photos. Did he still think that oh uh, Aaron did it? That it, you know, or did he ever admit nothing? He just shut up at this point. Yeah, remember they said that they never apologized, they never admitted to yeah. admitted to anything. But they what stopped, did happen? They stopped talking. That's all they did. They stopped talking. So uh and he actually got uh detective of the year that year, right? 2015. Right. He needs to throw that trophy. Yeah, he needs to throw that thing in the trash because he sucks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as a detective, man, you what you did to those folks is not right. Oh, that's and terrible. look, I, I understand you making a mistake or give having uh doubts about the story because it is so crazy, it's hard to believe. But the last thing you do is throw somebody under the bus. Like yeah, that. go out in public and throw them under the bus. Like, and we've experienced that. We're experiencing that literally right now. Okay, so let's talk about the vindication. So Matt Muller, Matthew Muller, uh, ends up with three life sentences, right? Yeah, he's in a tank. So he'll never see the light of day again. 
So they sue the Vallejo Police Department for defamation and slander. Mm -hmm. And they receive $2.5 million. 2.5. They get married and they have two little girls. Yep. Yep. I mean, that's, that's amazing. And they live are living happily ever, ever, ever after. And their, um, their reputation was restored. It turned out that what these police thought uh, that she was gone, girl, is not what happened at all. She really was a victim, and Aram really was a victim. And they were treated like they were actually the aggressors when they were actually the victim. And they were. And that's just like you said, that's terrible. It's not right. Like, I, you know, I'm sure that when detectives become detective, detectives and cops, you know, they probably they do their oath and stuff. I'm sure a part of their oaths, you know, they've got to, you know, I mean, a part of their job, they they've got to make sure to protect right? and serve, right? Protect and serve, you know, to protect and serve. And but, you know, you have you have people that maybe don't do their job like they should do. But then you have that one angel, that woman. That That's she's right. she's a true detective. Yeah, uh, she and did. We've experienced that with the Memphis Police Department, where uh, crimes happen and they wouldn't do anything about it. They just went, eh, we don't yeah. care." Oh, I saw a police report where the the report was not what I told them. Yeah, wasn't even close to what you said happened. You That's know, right. and I mean, wow. Okay. Yeah, and so uh, the one lesson that we can all take from this is. When somebody tells you something about someone, especially someone that you don't know personally, don't just believe them. Go out and look at that person's character, their body of work, um, especially if there's somebody in the public. Look at all those things before you judge them and especially before you start repeating the things that people are saying about them because it just might catch up with you. You just never know. Don't message the people. Yeah. And the other thing is, is why would you do that to a person anyway? Right. Um, you know, there's no point in going out and trying to destroy a person's uh, reputation. Um, and that kind of what, what how, how is that self-serving? How does that help you? It doesn't. And there's no point in it. See the good in people. And in. but anyway, this police department chose to decide what really happened, what they believe happened instead of what really happened through investigation and went out and reported on it. And it cost them $2.5 million. Not only that, not only did it cost them $2.5 million, but also now they've got a Netflix documentary out there about them and they'll always be remembered by the morons that they are. That's exactly right. And I say that a Netflix documentary may, it's a great idea. When you got it's content, you got content. That's right. And, Man, do we have content. Thank you all so much for watching. And uh, we ran over a little bit, but this is very interesting. Make sure you go watch it. Netflix, American Nightmares, three episodes. It's about 45 minutes an episode from my memory. And it goes very fast because it's uh, very, very interesting. And there's probably going to be some details that we didn't even cover in here that you will want to pay attention to. But friends, let me tell you. Don't just repeat things because people tell you about somebody else don't because most of the time it's not going to be true most of the time tighten up every chance you get be good to your friends be good to your other people be good to each other yeah be a better person and be a better person <laughs> don't, don't double trouble. trouble that's right we'll see you next time